I, um, it's very cold up at the farm today and the sat by a roaring fire and looked at the last episode of John Adams. This is the HBO epic on one of the founding fathers of the United States along with Washington and Jefferson. And towards the end, Adams and Jefferson are trying to make friends again. They've had a pretty rough trot, haven't got on too well, very different views of what uh, America should be. And um, Adams is bemoaning the fact that even while they're still alive, the, um, the, the nation around them, the, the population, is forgetting the revolution. And that's what happens with history. It's got a very, very short shelf life. Which brings us on to, um, to, the, to our next story. The inability of any of us anywhere, I think, to, to know much about our past. We think we do, and we often get it spectacularly wrong. Case in point, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, yes, tick. And in 1620, the pilgrims landed in America aboard the Mayflower. Well, we can probably tick that too. Most uh, Americans and Australians, I guess, know these dates. But there's much more to the history of discovery and settlement of America, much which has long been forgotten. For example, the first English settled in America, by the time the first English settled in America, other Europeans had already reached half of the 48 states. Jamestown in Virginia preceded Plymouth by 13 years as the first permanent English colony, and Plymouth wasn't even the first English colony in New England. Now, we welcome back to the program, and it's been ages since we last spoke, uh, Tony Horwitz, uh, who got himself a, well, his history major at university, and he decides to investigate this long-forgotten history and writes about it in a new book called A Voyage Long and Strange, Rediscovering the New World. Tony, of course, Pulitzer Prize-winning journo and writer, no stranger to the program. He's not an historian as such, but his philosophy is that history shouldn't be hard work. But I must say, Tony, you made it hard work for yourself. Is it true that you loaded yourself down in ancient armour just to see how, how hard it was to, to trudge across the landscape? Yeah, as part of the uh, book, I wanted to explore uh, what the conquistadors did in America and, and uh, encountered a band of um, conquistador reenactors, uh, people who were deranged enough to go out and put on <laughs> 60 pounds of uh, Spanish steel and, and clunk around uh, swamps in Florida to uh, reenact the exploits of Hernando de Soto and others. So, uh, yeah, I joined them for a bit. So a bit of uh, participatory history, I guess you could say. Now, Tony, I should point out that you're coming to us from Martha's Vineyard, and here's a bit of lost history, Martha's very famous vineyard. Who the hell was Martha? Okay, well, we don't know for sure. Either the, the uh, daughter or mother-in-law of the first um, European known to have landed here, a man named Bar Bartholomew Gosnold in 1602, <laughs> um, I'm inclined to think his daughter. They were both named Martha, and, and it seems to me if you find a beautiful place, you're more likely to name it after your daughter than your mother-in-law. But um, <laughs> he uh, he was actually searching not uh, for religious freedom like the pilgrims, but for a cure to syphilis, which was uh, then a big problem in Europe, and uh, a new disease brought there from the New World, and they thought that uh, its cure was uh, an American plant called sassafras, and he was searching for that and uh, found it on a nearby island here uh, that he named Elizabeth. Tony, that was very well done. I threw a curly one at you and I wouldn't have been <laughs> at all surprised if, if you'd been flummoxed, but there you have all the details. Now, Tony, why did you feel the need to rediscover the new world? I understand it dates from a, a brief detour to Plymouth Rock. Yeah, this book really began with my own ignorance. Um, I stopped to, to see Plymouth Rock, which actually isn't far from here, but I had never visited it, and uh, this sort of icon of American history. And while I was there, I, I fell to uh, talking with a park ranger who told me that uh, most visitors are completely confused by the history. Um, uh, 1620 is etched on the rock, uh, the year the uh, pilgrims landed, and a lot of people say, well, why doesn't it say 1492? 
And as she explained it, uh, many Americans <laughs> think that uh, Columbus sailed here, dropped off the pilgrims, and sailed home. Um, that really, uh, that, that intervening period is a complete blank, and, and the whole story is a, is a muddle, really. Uh, we do it sort of in units in school, you know, a unit on Columbus, and then we leap ahead and do a unit on the pilgrims, and then leap to what you were talking about before, the founding fathers in 1776. And all the intervening periods somehow get lost. And uh, at first I found this amusing, and then I realized that I was really just as ignorant as, as everyone else about this period, so decided to sort of dive in and see what I could find out. Gird your loins, put on armour, and uh, yeah. take it very seriously indeed. Okay, yeah. we, we've revealed the shocking truth that Plymouth wasn't exactly as significant as history would claim for it. Mm -hmm. Why did it endure? Why has it become so central to the imagination where earlier settlements are not only abandoned but forgotten? Right. Um, I think it's a case where the, the old truism that the winners write the history, this is a case where, where uh, it really is accurate. Um, it was um, the English and, and later Anglo-Americans who really triumphed in the contest for this uh, continent, and New Englanders in particular. You mentioned before uh, John Adams. Um, there, there's really been a New England bias in, in the writing of American history. So not only did they sort of diminish or leave out the role of the French, and the Spanish and wicked Catholics and really all the non-English, they even diminished the role of, of Jamestown, which, which preceded Plymouth, because it was in Virginia, it's the South. Um, and in the 19th century, obviously, a lot of tension between North and South. And Jamestown was cast as sort of as, as Plymouth's, you know, degenerate Southern twin and, <laughs> and sort of easy to forget. Um, so we came away with this really uh, quite distorted uh, notion of our, of our history that, you know, it all begins here in in New England, when that's really just uh, one piece of the story. I love the, the pilgrims arriving in Massachusetts. They're met by Somerset, an Indian who greets the settlers in English and asks them for a beer. Yeah, uh, you know, the pilgrims uh, really are latecomers. They're not only not the first comers, they're, they're, they're really at the end of over a century of contact by other Europeans, so that people like Samoset uh, have already encountered English fishermen further up the coast in Maine, and uh, in addition to picking up a few words of their language, he evidently uh, picked up a taste for their beverages, too. Um, so this whole sort of fascinating, to me, um, story of first contact, which I explored in my last book with Captain Cook, uh, that story is, is really forgotten here because we, we begin with the pilgrims who, who arrive at a time when Native Americans have really already had a, a century or more of contact. They're not, um, they're not fresh faces getting off the boat. I can understand why the Norseman, Eric the Red, has been written out of American history so spectacularly because he probably would have thoroughly alarmed Senator McCarthy. Tell us about, tell us about Eric the Red. Yeah, Eric, I mean, to begin, the, the European story at, the, at its uh, true beginning on this continent, as, as best we know, uh, it was the Vikings who, who came here a thousand years ago to what's now uh, not too, uh, 